Hey, I'm Jonathan Larson, Managing Editor of the Young Turks. This is TYTI Daily, and it's sort of a special edition for us because I'm here with Jeff Charlotte, the author of The Family, and also the star um, reporter, executive producer, I believe. Tell me if I'm missing anything, Jeff. Is that about cover it? Executive producer, yeah. The series is based on a couple of books uh, that I wrote, although a lot of the credit should be given to director Jesse Moss and executive producer uh, Alex Gibney, who decided to take that reporting up into the present and turn it into this documentary format. And this is the documentary we're talking about is the five episode series now available on Netflix, which has a lot of people talking and looking at this, even uh, adding to the number that your book, C Street and the Family, already drew interest on this. And um, I, I wanted to start off with something, I don't know if you've seen it all, but the family, also known as the Fellowship Foundation, also known as the International Foundation, possibly also known as some other things, they issued a statement in response to the documentary. Have you seen this? Yeah. You have. Can I read it to you and get your response? Sure. Okay. Uh, quoting here, though the Netflix docudrama series mischaracterizes the work of the Fellowship and attempts to portray people of faith in a bad light, we are encouraged by how often viewers are introduced to and challenged by the person and principles of Jesus, which are at the core of our mission and message. Perhaps they will also better understand the integrity and transformational impact of this informal network to encourage everyone in a spirit of friendship and reconciliation to love God with all their heart, soul, and mind, and to love their neighbor as themselves. So do you have any response to that? What was your reaction when, when you did see that? I mean, the first reaction is one of the, uh, I think, the achievements of the documentary and, and director Jesse Moss was to get a number of representatives of the fellowship of the family on screen. I believe there's something like about 12 of them and they get a lot of screen time. So much screen time that in fact, some people are saying, wait, I'm confused. Am I supposed to like this organization? And, and you know, my answer is like, look, if, if you like deceptive anti-democratic practices, maybe this is for you. I can't, I can't decide that for you. Um, but we gave them their I say. I like you put your thumb on the scale a little bit just now. <laughs> a little bit. I, that's the kind of journalist I am. Um, I'm trying to portray them in a bad light. We didn't try and portray them in a bad light. There's no 60-minute style interviews. Um, oftentimes they say things that are just factually not true, but we let them have their say. We're not, we're not jumping in. Um, there's no, I mean, we're working with some, you know, some of the really brilliant film editors of the day. And in documentary, you're always talking about juxtaposition of image, sound, and, uh, and you know, jumping away to photos and so on. In the interviews with the representatives of the family, we don't do that. We just let them have the screen and we let them talk as long as they want. We made extensive efforts to say, who else wants to speak? We opened, you know, they, they've never had as golden an opportunity as this to put forth their side of the story. And they do put forth their side of the story. And in fact, some people are persuaded by it. And you know, that's, that's fine. So this idea that they're mischaracterized, if that's the case, they have no one to blame but themselves because they are primarily responsible for representing themselves in their own words. A Couple other points in there though, I find troubling. Uh, one that, that it's an attempt to represent people of faith in a bad light. I find that bigoted and I'll just go a little bit further. I'll call it anti-Christian because a number of the critics that you see in the series and in the books speaking out um, against what they see as the abuses of power of the family are themselves devout Christians. Uh, we see Reverend Will Eric Williams, we see Leslie Kern um, who challenged uh, their um, the family's uh, uh, identification of their C Street house for congressmen, subsidized housing for congressmen as a church. We see uh, Warren Throckmorton, uh, a really impressive figure to my mind, um, self-described fundamentalist Christian, uh, former leader of the sort of the, the, the so-called kind of pray the gay away movement until as a person of conscience, he realized that it was bunk. And so as a person of conscience, um, and great integrity, and Christian of great integrity, he's challenging. Those are the people who are speaking out here. So to say that we're attempting to present people of faith in a bad light means that they're declaring that those Reverend Williams and Leslie and Warren Throckmorton don't count in their book. 
as people. Let us get to the sort of theological question here, which which I didn't anticipate necessarily having the time to discuss with you, but since you kind of touched on it, I'm a little curious, which is it all seems to revolve around this notion of who gets to decide what Christian is, right? Well, or to them, what Jesus is, because I mean, to me, the theological element is, is what's most interesting and it's what has always compelled my research. And frankly, I think it's a big piece of why the family has evaded, mostly evaded press scrutiny over the years um, is, uh, you know, they're more or less above board financially, more or less, I'll say, right? Um, where things get really iffy is when you talk about Jesus, right? So they say, we're glad people are uh, being introduced to the person of Jesus through this uh, series, at least. Well, which, which Jesus do you mean? Because there's a lot of different ideas about Jesus. They use the term deliberately, vaguely, uh, and in the series, we see uh, we see Doug Coe, the longtime leader of the family, uh, and he likes to compare. This is not a one off. This was I mean, I've been through years and years of his papers. This was a sort of a core teaching. How do you understand who Jesus is? Well, you look at figures, strong men of history. Uh, some examples he gives are Hitler, Lenin, Mao, Pol Pot, Osama bin Laden. Now, he says those guys are bad guys. He's not a Nazi. He's not a. Uh, a, a fascist. Uh, he's not a communist. He's not he's certainly not uh, Osama bin Laden. What he admires, the common denominator in those men is brutal strength. And he says, that's what we want for Jesus. And suddenly any Christian who's listening has to say, wait a minute, when they say Jesus, they don't mean the same thing that I experience at my church. And one of the things you cover in the documentary series is uh, the death of Co and uh, Doug Coe, and, and you sort of raise the prospect of who is in charge now. And, and you and I were talking a little bit before we started rolling here about what we do or don't know about who is in charge. Um, and I think without me realizing you were working on the documentary or you realizing that I was doing some reporting at the time, we were doing some reporting at the Young Turks towards the beginning of this year. Um, and one of the things I was hoping we could do in this discussion is um, uh, you said you mentioned when we were speaking that you were hoping people would pick up the threads. And and I realized that, you know, your reporting sort of ended at a certain point so that you could finish the documentary, obviously. And I'm hoping that you you can sort of connect uh, some of that connective tissue of what you did with what um, what we were able to find out. And so uh, let me ask you just sort of flat out, Doug Code dies, I believe 2017, help me with the time frame there, maybe February of 2017, I believe. Yeah. Um, then, who's, then who's in charge? This has been the big question of, uh, of the fellowship since. Um, we see a couple of contenders in the series. We see Doug Burley, uh, former leader of Young Life and the son-in-law of Doug Coe. Um, also the, the figure who in episode three is, is more or less responsible for bringing the Russian spy Maria Butina into these sort of higher, highest halls of power in the United States. Um, a man who's always who's been the, the sort of the family's man in Russia, Doug Burley. We see former Congressman Zach Womp, a former resident of the C Street House um, and a guy who uh, would like to see himself uh, maybe uh, ascending in the organization. There's other uh, other folks who wouldn't talk. Um, there's a, a former Democratic congressman named T Tony Hall uh, who's taken a leadership role. Um, uh, there's other figures, which was interesting, and you know, a lot of stuff. When you do this kind of reporting, stuff gets off the record. So people tell you stuff. There were figures who thought that they were going to be moving up into that top spot which they understand is a theological position. This is not something you are elected to. Um, and uh, they thought they were anointed. And not only were they not anointed, they were pushed out of the organization. The same kind of leadership struggle, by the way, took place in 1969 when Doug Coe took over. And he was by no means the obvious candidate to, to succeed uh, the role of the founder. He was the least known man, in fact. And that actually turned out to be his strength his ability to work without need for recognition. So these figures, and I, I, I don't know if this documentary would have looked at all the same 
if Dovco hadn't died in 2017. Figures like Congressman Zach Womp, I don't think they would be talking on camera or a Larry Ross, the publicist. Um, there is a struggle now, and that's, it's been simmering in the movement for a while. Um, should we try and go a little more public and be respectable? And I think there's also ego involved. Some of these men want credit for what they've done. Um, or should we stay, as Doug Coe put it, submerged, um, which some of them say, look, it just makes us much more influential and more effective. It's a real tension. So one of the people we were reported on was a guy named Ron Cameron, um, who was at, has actually been on the board uh, way back uh, in the aughts, uh, actually was on the board while you were there, and is very much, uh, very clearly, openly, outly a Trump supporter. This is not a bipartisan or nonpartisan figure in the way that Doug Coe was, or at least ostensibly was, by any stretch of the imagination. And um, I, I guess I'm wondering, so we had, a, we had one source who had been at the breakfast tell us that they asked, who will it be after Doug Coe? And was told that there was a group of people, which included Cameron, who was expecting to take up the reins. And I'm wondering whether the fact that, A, whether you have any insights onto Cameron or, or that you mentioned some people getting pushed out, who's left? You know, if you can talk about what that dynamic looks like, at least from, from the perspective of what you know and what you, what you knew about that faction, if you will, in the past, including, including Burley, who I want to talk a little bit more about in a second. I mean, you know, my, my biggest reaction is gratitude to you for your reporting because you're taking it further than I have. And and I should say, you know, uh, look, I wrote these books 2008, 2010, The Family in C Street. And then I thought I was done with the story. And I said, look, let other people take it up. And they did. You know, there's been other reporting. Um, uh, the Religion Oklahoma, News. Religion News, but also uh, 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 World Magazine, a... Yeah. Fundamentalist Magazine did terrific investigative reporting. Yeah. Um, I think it's called The Daily Oklahoman, uh, really dug into Senator Jim Inhofe and his use of taxpayer dollars to pursue this work in Africa. Um, uh, and, and state by state, there's been small bits of reporting. There's been scholarship like uh, uh, Kevin Cruz's book, uh, terrific. I um, know I'm blanking on the name of the book. If, if you don't mind, if I'll look over here. I have it somewhere on my shelf. Ah. Uh, Kevin Cruz, uh, K-R-U-S-E, because I can't remember the title of his book. Everyone knows him from Twitter. It's okay. <laughs> Everyone knows him from Twitter, and it's an excellent book. And he dug deeper into the relationship of Eisenhower and the foundation of the prayer breakfast. And this is really how it's supposed to work, right? This is not my story. I don't know the story. So when you talk about Ronnie Cameron, I'm going to just come right out and say, um, yeah, he was on the board. I looked into it briefly when I was writing C Street because I was interested in Congressman uh, Robert Adderholt from Arkansas who, um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, from Alabama, is that a whole, uh, do I have that wrong? Oh, God. Um, no. Uh, uh, I think you have it right. Arkansas is where, um, Cameron. Yes. Yeah. Cameron is based. Yes. Uh, and Alabama. Yes. And uh, so we looking at the in the series, uh, we look at uh, Congressman Adderhold's travels to Romania on the family's dime to push an anti LGBTQ agenda. Um, in the book, I look at Congressman Adderholt's really bizarrely financed efforts uh, on behalf of it's not quite clear what he's trying to do in Sri Lanka. Um, the upshot of it, there was uh, U.S. military support for an absolutely brutal and murderous regime. Um, in exchange, I guess you could say they got um, uh, uh, open an open field for Christian missionaries. They they were man they managed to block a law that would have prevented evangelism. Um, uh, but there was this other element, and 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 really, I'd almost turn turn it back to you uh, of the kind of the the kind of petty business that goes on in the family, and has always been there. Um, uh, men using it as a kind of a uh, sort of behind the scenes business network. And the family would say, look, that's not our fault. Well, you create a secretive organization and you put people in together. This is going to happen. So you have Cameron uh, and um, uh, there's another executive of a poultry company and you have Adderholt. Dabs Cabin. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and you have Adderholt who has sort of played this. Well, actually, let me just for yeah. full context there. 
Ronnie Cameron owns the poultry company, Mount Air. Dabs Cavan was, I believe, CFO yeah. of that exact same poultry company, Cameron's Poultry Company, Mount Air, and also served for some period of time as the president of the board of the fellowship. So, Right. And, you know, meanwhile, uh, this poultry uh, company has been giving money to the uh, to the fellowship, which has been financing Adderholt's travels around the world. And Adderholt, in turn, becomes a champion for the interests of the poultry com company and the poultry industry. And if you're sitting there listening and saying, chickens, who cares? That's big agriculture. Um, and that's there. You now you're talking about uh, uh, an industry that is really intersecting with the key issues of, of, of the environment, of immigration. Um, they have a lot of issues before congressmen, before Congress. And in Adderholt, they have a fairly effective uh, quiet representative. And I believe the Center for Responsive Politics did a lot of reporting on this, uh, the Adderholt Mount Air connection. Uh, Adderholt was chair of the Agriculture Committee, I believe, at the time. So the oversight there, quite considerable. I want to bounce one, one Adderholt tidbit off of you just to get your take on it. Um, Adderholt's name briefly surfaced in the Manafort stuff. Um, the FBI said that uh, two of Manafort's Ukrainian lobbyists, and by that I don't mean they were of the nationality of the Ukraine, they were representing, they were lobbying for Ukraine, met with Adderholt. We actually reported last year at the Young Turks that on one of Adderholt's uh, fellowship funded visits overseas, he met with Manafort's clients in the Ukraine, the Ukrainian oligarchs who had, who, who had hired those lobbyists that he met with there. And so we were interested in the possibility of, you know, whatever whatever machinations were going on in Trump world or around Ukraine and Manafort's lobbying. And to be fair, there were there were some non-Republicans involved in that that whole mess as well. But I'm curious to get your take on the fact that the fellowship that that he met with two had two separate meetings on the fellowship's time with Manafort lobbyists while he was in Ukraine. Or is that is that I guess I'm get, I guess I'm asking, is that sinister or is that just part and parcel of the network with everyone, talk with everyone ethos at work here? Yes. <laughs> the answer to both is yes. Uh, it is part and parcel and it's part and parcel of a system that is so deeply corrupt. It doesn't even know the name. I, you know, look, my understanding of this is formed right at the beginning of my career. I was a cub reporter for the San Diego Reader. Um, and I remember there was a big, um, a big stadium deal going on, right? And one of the city council woman, uh, women was also uh, a lawyer representing stadium interests. And I went to her and I said, you know, well, isn't this conflict of interest? And I remember her looking at me blankly without, with, without you know, she wasn't trying to put one over on me. She says, what do you mean? Right. What do you mean? To her, it was just good business. Right. This is perfect because she's representing it and she can vote on it. Yeah. That's ideal. Yeah. That's efficiency. And and that idea of efficiency, that brings us back to the theology because the family does actually embrace that as an idea of efficiency. That goes back to the very roots of the organization and um, a conviction that democracy was unwieldy and it put Elites who should be aligned, making decisions for the rest of us in conflict with one another, and that in the systems that they admired. And back then, it really was fascist Germany. They didn't want to be fascist, but boy, did they, they did make the trains run on time. How could we bring that to the United States? Um, they said, let's bring these people together uh, through the person of Jesus, and they'll make things work. So from our perspective, it's not sinister. It's the way it's supposed to be. And I was fascinated to learn through the documentary about the the really virulent anti-labor roots of the the sentiment um, sort of fueling the family in its in its earliest days. That was kind of fascinating. And it kind of brings me back around to the question of when we talk about Adderholt's travel or or um, actually you and I were talking about another story we broke about this um, affiliate of the uh, family called Leadership Development Seminars out in Seattle, which uh, is very much connected with Burley. He's on, I don't remember exactly what position he holds with them, but it, 
to use the phrase again, part and parcel. And money flows back and forth between the leadership development seminars and the family. And we found tax returns showing that, I believe it was 2017, leadership development seminars reported over $400,000 in expenses related to work in the former Soviet Union. The first one of which was about paying, incurring expenses to bring people to the National Prayer Breakfast, which sounded on the face of it a lot like what we saw with the NRA, where questions about, well, where's this money coming from? And it also raises the question of, Who's deciding how to spend it? And it doesn't seem like anyone's come up with a definitive answer. Even when Doug Coe was alive and, and healthy, was he solely deciding who to write the checks to, which travel to fund? Did we know then? Do we know now? Well, no. And that, that's an interesting thing. That was in, in the family's response to the series. They said, you know, this is an informal network. And in fact, I wanted to take issue with that, right? Um, because, I mean, this goes back, I remember in 2008 when I was first doing this this work, um, their response then was to deny they exist. Right. So other, you know, I remember NBC News following up on my reporting tries to contact them, and they said there's no organization at all. And and I actually showed you. I had I made my own spreadsheet. They yeah. have an actual board of directors. They that's have a board of directors. The IRS going well back before 2008. They 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 have they have tax documents and they have membership rules going back to the early 1940s, and where they make, in fact, very careful distinctions between the rank and level of involvement of, of, in, of individuals. They have a database. So it's not an informal organization in that sense. There's one way in which it can claim to be informal, and that's through what they sometimes call the man method of financing. The man method of financing, otherwise known as off the books, moving money beyond uh, beyond the eyes of the IRS and lobbying laws. And, and this really comes, it can, it can take the form of, I really like the work you're doing in Ukraine. You know, let me give you a gift, a financial gift. And that's not going to show up on any 501c3. Um, it's going to be like Doug Coe's salary, which you've probably seen over the years. Sometimes, sometimes it was a modest salary. Sometimes it was nothing. And yet here was a guy walking around in alligator shoes and flying on private jets, even though he was officially making no money. He was being supported through the man method. The other form that takes place, and it sounds like you've done terrific work on this and there's more to be done, um, is through this interlocking network of 501c3s, um, where you know, you'll get one 501c3 that is created, it gets an anonymous infusion of cash. And this financed Adderholt's travels uh, to Sri Lanka, for instance, um, and a, a huge anonymous uh, uh, infusion of cash, which it immediately transfers over to another 501c3, which bumps it to another, and then eventually it gets used uh, to pay for someone to travel or to pay for someone to come here. And, we, and by then, the idea of asking who gave this money, why they gave this money, what they're getting out of it is almost impossible, except in one case that we tell in the series, that of Congressman Mark Siljander. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm always careful to say, people say, Is, are you some kind of conspiracy theorist? I'm like, no, I'm really not because the family is not a conspiracy. Right. Um, they, you know, mostly uh, you're allowed to do this. My, my issue with them is not actually so much how much they're breaking the laws. My issue is one of what kind of democratic practice do we want, right? Um, I see them as a social movement, one that I disagree with, but as a social movement. Um, except in the case of Congressman uh, Siljander, who was in fact indicted for conspiracy. There, the term makes sense. And he was moving money in that exact same method, that man method through the interlocking 501c3s, where he was being paid to illegally lobby for um, some surprising characters, right? Um, uh, he was uh, working on oil sanctions in Sudan, he was working for uh, uh, a figure um, uh, who was identified as a um, uh, an international terrorist by the United States, uh, trying to move him off those lists. And, and so, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, well, I mean, so that's 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 what when we talk about that financing, that's what becomes important to follow because oftentimes there's sort of a, a I want to use my terms carefully. Um, uh, there's a cleansing process through the 501c3s by which 
point the money gets to the congressman who's traveling on it, it's at a remove of several steps from its source. I love the way you teed up one thing I want to share with you right now, which is um, we looked at the money trail from Ron Cameron, who has a charity which is essentially run by him, uh, his functionaries at his company, associates. Basically, he seems to have sole control of the thing called the Jesus Fund. I don't know if you came across that name in your, uh, you know, looking into this, but they were a primary bankroller of the Fellowship Foundation. And what what we found was that, uh, I don't remember the years exactly, maybe 2013, 2014, the Jesus Fund's money, uh, funding of the Fellowship essentially dried up, virtually disappeared over the course of a year. At almost exactly the same time, the Jesus Fund dramatically scaled up its donations to the National Christian Foundation. And if you're not familiar with the National Christian Foundation, they are massive and they they engage in what are called donor advised funds where a billionaire or a millionaire gives them money. I know you know all this, but I just want to bring everyone else up to speed too. Someone gives them money and says, hey, give this to that organization that I love. And this goes back to what you were saying about the, keeping their fingerprints off it because now it's because money's fungible, it goes into this one big fund and how that donor advises his donation be used, that's not, there's no requirements for that to be reported. And what we found was that right at the same time, the Jesus Fund took down its donations to the Fellowship Foundation, the family, its donations to the National Christian Foundation dramatically increased. And so did the National Christian Foundation's donations to the family. So it seems like on the surface, and we asked Cameron, he wouldn't say, we asked the fellowship, they wouldn't say, we asked Cameron essentially, did you just put another intermediary in there so that you know it wouldn't be quite so clear? We, we got no answer on it. And I do wanna, I, I do wanna uh, make a point about the, the mystery, both the mystery here and the access you got. If people aren't aware, I just wanna make a point of, of saying, just how amazing and unprecedented the access you got, which you personally told me, I guess your director, you largely credited your director with that, but the the people you got on camera, just the fact that you got them in a chair, it's important that I think that people watching this know how rare and unprecedented this was. So all, all kinds of you know credit to you and the team there, because I was sitting there going, you know, just well, my attempts. There's a sense <laughs> they were attempting to play us too. And I, I mean, I, and I think, you know, you look at a Larry Ross, who is a publicist we see on camera and uh, a, a sometimes board member of the organization, but also sort of a, a publicist to the evangelical megastars, you know. For decades. Yes, really Republican, powerful figure Republican in media. Evangelical megastars, yeah. And, you know, uh, Ross was the guy, uh, when I look at his strategy, um, uh, I go back to 2008 and I published my book, The Family, and The Family's response then was nothing. And right. that was actually worked terrific. Um, it sort of made it go away until three uh, politicians, Senator John Ensign, Governor Mark Sanford, and Representative Chip Pickering, uh, had extramarital affairs, which the family then attempted to cover up through their C Street house. We tell those stories. Um, we don't tell the story of Congressman Pickering, who actually had his liaisons in the C Street house, registered as a church, the subsidized housing, with a lobbyist, who he then later went uh, to work with. Um, but uh, um, so that sort of brought it out into the public. And, and, um, even then, when I continued my reporting, there was real tension. We've seen the series a man named Bob Hunter, who is, uh, speaks a little bit about their relationship with Uganda, where their branch of the family there created something called the Kill the Gays Bill, which is exactly what it sounds like. And the Americans recognized that this was bad publicity. Um, uh, you know, in the series, we can't tell as much, we can't go into as much depth. Bob sat down with me for a three hour conversation in 2010. And Bob wanted to actually be more visible. He's part of the faction and wanted to be more visible. Um, and yet he spoke incredibly candidly. Bob, why do you use these congressmen? Why do you send them 
uh, overseas uh, to meet with these foreign heads of state, with the oil executives and so on. His answer, plain as day, and I'm quoting, their bait. Their bait. And I said, Bob, when you're there with um, the dictator and so on, and, but you don't, you don't press hard on issues of human rights. And, oh, no, we don't talk about that because that would ruin access. And I said, so it's sort of a soft sell evangelism. The quote, so soft you don't even know what's happening. Um, I mean, candor like this is uh, it's just astonishing, right? Larry Ross, the publicist, I think, understood that since this was going to keep coming, right? There had been, um, uh, before me, there had been Lisa Getter in the LA Times. Uh, then there was my work. Um, uh, and now comes this documentary. What they do is they go on camera and they talk. Yeah. How candid they are now, now, that's a different story. But they, uh, Larry Ross understood that, that's, that there's going to be a number of people who are going to say, well, what's the big deal? Here they are just saying they're just a bunch of guys who, who like to pray together with Jesus. They said that. And to an extent, it worked. I'll, I'll say this. I mean, the series has gotten, I think, tremendous viewership. Um, but once again, here's a big story. And most of the mainstream press is just cruising on by, just like they did earlier this year when the New York Times actually did some good reporting and looked at how the National Prayer Breakfast was functioning as an yeah. all books lobbying event. Yeah, that was a really important piece. It was an important piece without any follow up, which is the history of the family, good so, without follow-up. I saw online that you responded um, to, uh, I don't know if it's fair to call it criticism, but someone pointed out that it seemed like there was more of a focus on Republicans than Democrats. And you pointed out, well, hello, we mentioned Chris Coons, among other people. Yeah, and Jimmy Carter. <laughs> yes, right. But my question, uh, what I was cu very curious about was, did you ask Chris Coons for a sit-down interview about the family? Um, I didn't do any asking because uh -huh. I am in the documentary um, as an executive producer and being based on my books, I have a sort of say, but it's not my series. Um, I, meant, I meant you, the team. Oh, that, yeah. So they saw interviews with everybody they could. And they did. They, I mean, we also see um, uh, uh, Janice Hahn, a Democrat from, yeah. from California. And again, there's no gotcha. I mean, if anything, I would have been a little tougher than the choice my colleagues made. We see her speaking positively of the fellowship. It would have been worth to me identifying what kind of Democrat she is, which is to say, you know, she is the Congress or was a Congresswoman from the defense industry. Um, so, yeah, sorry, go ahead. And 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 the Democrats who've been, who have been involved, every now and then there is a, a genuine liberal. A lot of times, um, Tony Hall, who is in a leadership position, a congressman from Ohio, um, and if you track his career, and in fact, at times he's been candid about this, he talks about how through the family he came to realize um, that a number of the positions he held as a Democrat were wrong. So he's still, because, he's still a Democrat. I think of Senator Mark Pryor, um, former senator uh, from, from, from Arkansas, Democrat, you know, you know, a Democrat. He was a pro-life, pro-war, sure. anti-labor. Blue dog. Blue dog is putting it mildly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Congressman Bart Stupak, author, co-author of the Stupak Pitts Amendment, one of the sort of the big pivot point in the current rollback of reproductive rights, working with his family brother, Joe Pitts, a Republican, to roll back reproductive rights. Um, that's the kind of Democratic involvement mostly we've had with a very few liberals. So we didn't focus on those liberals, although, look, we got Jimmy Carter to sit for an interview. Yeah. Um, uh, we, we, you know, we have and we show some of the works that they've done that might be liberal. We let Bob Hunter sit there and say, I'm a liberal. We don't want to get into an argument with him about what that means. Um, a lot of people said, how can we Ted Lieu, but these are both very progressive people who have been publicly willing to publicly put their name on the letterhead, be affiliated with the with the organization for with sure. The letterhead is, is actually kind of a different deal. And, and one of the things that I, I, I caution against, actually, is people who are researching this to see names on that letterhead and say, aha, so-and-so and so-and-so was involved. Right. No, it doesn't mean it. The letterhead means almost nothing. And the family knows that and says that in internal documents. It means someone who says, oh, sure, I'll go to a weekly prayer breakfast. I might not actually make it on a weekly basis. Right. The Congressional Weekly Prayer Breakfast is a very banal event. There's none of this discussion. Let's send I meant, meant for the National Prayer Breakfast, but there's a similar dynamic there. We were we were told 
something similar. Well, so and so asked me if I they could put my name on the letterhead. That sounds yeah, good. Sure. Prayer. Yeah, sure. You know, I mean, I, I campaign in churches, and that's fine. And yeah. oh, it's a bipartisan thing. That seems right. fine. And that is actually the involvement of most congressmen. So you have to distinguish um, between those who were, you know, for instance, I think about this with Senator Jesse Helms, who I had found in their archives. And when I was living with them, uh, uh, you know, Helms had sort of been one of the, the pivot points. I'm like, Helms is involved. I didn't understand what this was. Just recently, a former member who had worked for Helms was talking to me. This is like, well, I should clarify. Helms was willing to work with them when they would help him do what he wanted. Right. Helms would not go out of their way for them. Right. That distinguishes him from someone like Senator uh, Chuck Grassley of Iowa, who is a longtime, deeply active member. And and so that, you know, we don't want to sort of see this as bigger than it is. There's a lot that part of their the illusion that they maintain is by bringing these names to the prayer breakfast and making people think that they have more people in their orbit than they really so do. So that's, that's, I think, a really important point here. And we actually, we were able to get Chris Coons on camera at this most recent um and this was a 60 minute style, uh, you know, but the, if, <laughs> if you won't talk to us, you gotta do you it. Yeah. yeah, so we uh, we had a reporter show up with a camera and and talk to him, you know, oh, I've got a meeting to go to. It was that quick. It was two minutes, roughly. But he said that, that he is concerned about the perception of partisanship around it. And, and I do think that the sort of um, PR function that some of these Democrats serve to give the impression of bipartisan involvement and engagement, right? When you see a bunch of Republicans and Democrats, you all on the letterhead together, you tend to assume there's equal involvement. But if the deep involvement is only from the Republicans, what should we be thinking about or asking the Democrats who lend their names to, to, to give the, an appearance that's not factual? I want to ask every Republican, every Democrat, everyone elected to office who takes an oath, what are you thinking and lending your name to something that one compares Jesus to Hitler, which is, should be insulting to every Christian in America? You know, find another Bible study. You can, you can do better. I, I promise. You want a conservative Bible study. You can do better. An organization um, that for decades hid its private sectarian sponsorship of the National Prayer Breakfast and in its internal documents that have now been shown, says we're doing this to give the appearance of this being an official event. It doesn't matter whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. This is not square dealing. Get away from it. So that's what I would say to the Democrats. Um, there are Democrats who are deeply involved, as I said. You know, it's mostly Republicans. So to Chris Coons, uh, concern about it being partisan, you know, look at the history of this thing, which has always been, I've never done an exact count, but around 80, 90 percent Republican or further right and overseas becomes, you know, if if your your great brothers are Ferdinand Marcos in the Philippines and Sahardo in Indonesia and Sonny, General Sonny Abacha in, in Nigeria and the generals who ruled Brazil, maybe it's time to ask, uh, what kind of relationships are we building? What kind of accountability are we asking for? Chris Coons, I don't know the level of his involvement. It's hard for me to believe that it's particularly deep. I think he probably enjoys bipartisan prayer, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, he, gave, he gave an interview with Religion News where he was asked in the context of the Russian attendees at the breakfast, whether there ought to be more vetting of the guests. And his response was, I am responsible for the programming. He's co-chair multiple years, right? That he's he's pretty much their most reliable go-to as a public face, I think is pretty fair to say on the Democratic side. And he's his response was, I'm involved in the programming of the event, right? It's a multi-day event, the National Prayer Breakfast. Not I leave the vetting to the leadership. And I do want to um before I let you go, and I promise I will let you go, um, as you can tell, I just, <laughs> I've got so many questions about all of this stuff, but I do want to get, uh, make a point about Coons, which was, we talked earlier about Ron Cameron, head of the Mount Air uh, chicken company, poultry company. Cameron is a dedicated funder of Republican politics, literally was at the 2016, excuse me, 2018 midterm election returns 
watch them on TV at the White House with Donald Trump. That's how that's how embedded he is in the money of the of the party. And we found that he gave to virtually he's given to virtually everyone you can think of Republican candidates in state after state down ballot. The, the Cameron Mount Air money is everywhere except in Delaware. Nothing, nothing <laughs> donated. Nothing, nothing donated against the rivals of Chris Coons or Tom Carper, who I believe now more recently, the other senator from Delaware, now more recently has lent his name to some fellowship um, activities or letterheads or something along those lines. Both men, I should point out, also members of the chicken caucus within the Senate. And I wanted to get your your reaction because there's a disparity here, which is Bill Nelson was another high level, he was a senator from Florida, very high level elected official who was closely affiliated with the fellowship. His wife was on the board. Yeah. Grace Nelson was on the board. And in that same year, 2018, while um, I don't remember whether Coons or Carper or either of them was up for election, but uh, Cameron has not laid a finger on Coons or Carper. In fact, the, the primary poultry trade group has donated money to Coons's Blue Hen Pack, literally the only Democratic pack that they've maxed out to. Um, by contrast, and here's where I'm curious to get your reaction, Cameron went deeply, deeply into unseating uh, Bill Nelson in his election efforts against Rick Scott, to the point where I believe he was, he was the first funder and provided 15% of the donations to, um, I believe it was called Count the Vote, which was when, which was this pack that sprang up in the immediate aftermath of the very close vote when they were looking at recounts and election challenges. Ron Cameron was pretty much the number one money guy and ended up kicking out one of, of the Senate. He won and got out of the Senate one of the fellowship's, you know, reliable allies. Something similar, I don't know the details to the same extent, happened with Heidi Heitkamp, who had been, you know, again, at the minimum, willing to be on the letterhead. But Cameron came in and, and threw his money at both of those folks. I'm curious to hear your reaction to that dynamic in light of the Delaware uh, Cameron free zone. I mean, I think, I think this is where, where the family's claim to being an informal network actually has some validity, right? Uh, in the sense that they're not taking legislative positions the way the Family Research Council does. Um, they're not endorsing candidates. Um, and in fact, their ideal election is one in which the two opponents are both members of the family, uh, as happened uh, some years ago uh, to the great consternation of both uh, when Jerry Moran and Todd Tehart from Kansas both vied for a Senate seat. Um, and uh, the backing ended up going to Moran, which Tehart, who was the more conservative figure, they're both conservatives, um, was outraged at, and Moran lived at C Street, and T. Hart visited, and, and I think T. Hart felt a little bit like, um, gee, guys, just because I want to spend time with my actual family, you're not going to stand by me? Um, and Moran, in fact, enjoyed not only the support of Republicans, but he actually enjoyed support of Democratic C Streeters. Um, here we have now, in fact, uh, Mark Sanford talking about primarying Donald Trump. Now, Donald Trump's not a member of the family, but as we see, a, a number of them have thrown in behind him and is the kind of leader that they uh, they feel that they can work with. Um, so I think the idea of Cameron pushing against Nelson, Bill Nelson in Florida, um, is a little bit, it's sort of, that from their perspective, to give them all credit, says, look, we are not, we're not trying to control anything. Um, and you could you could argue like you're right you're not trying to control anything except everything. Um, in other words, to have both sides. Whoever well, Doug Coe, the longtime leader, says we work with power where we can, build new power where we can't. Right, um, and uh, this means that if you have um, people ask me, for instance, what's going to happen if you know uh, uh, Bernie Sanders becomes elected president. Well, I'm absolutely positive they're going to give him an invitation to the national prayer breakfast. And my guess is he would go. It's a, I mean, that's sort of how the event is organized. 
who's going to be the first president to say, no, I'm against prayer? It doesn't play. They understood that in the public face, it has to be bland enough, has to be banal enough that no one can turn away, right? No one can say no to that. That creates the sort of the shell within which the actual political work uh, can happen. And that actual political work will have arguments. You'll have people and disagreement. Um, another example I'd give you is um, uh, a little clip you've probably come across, uh, uh, Al Gore, um, out of office, uh, uh, testifying before the Senate on climate change. And Senator Jim Inhofe, who is a diehard member of the family oh, yes, and yes. a leading climate denialist is grilling him. And Gore attempts, says, why don't we meet through our mutual friend, Doug Coe, and try and talk this through. And look, Coe would have been happy, to, uh, maybe that happened, I don't know, Al Gore wasn't gonna talk about it. Um, Coe would have been happy to bring them together to talk about it. The whole goal of the organization is to move these kinds of this kind of decision making, as they put it, beyond the din of the Vox Populi, beyond the voice of the people, um, and into a room where key men can make decisions. And Al Gore will be a key man, and Bill Nelson will be a key man. And if these guys are okay with the fact that they are in the 10 to 20 percent faction in a room full of Republicans, then it's going to work out for them. It's not going to work out for us, the voters, on transparency in our government. So let's let's end on. Um, you mentioned earlier the idea that you wanted people to pick up some of the threads. That there are still questions that need to be answered. Oh, sure. What what should people be picking up on? And when I say people, I mean reporters. What what should journalism broadly be looking at regarding this organization and the people in it? I think three things. One, what you're doing right now is following the money, in which uh, the fundamentalist World Magazine did. World Magazine said, said, let's start looking at real estate deals. Let's start looking at, they have a vast amount of property. Uh, let's start looking about how some of these properties are moving you know, for a dollar, right, in between members of the family. And where did the money to buy this property come from, right? Um, I'll be right up front. I didn't start this work as an investigative reporter. I've always been interested in lived religion. What does religion mean? How does it work out? And that drew me into the politics of the family, into the theology of the family, the stories that they tell and the stories that that tells about American power. Um, but I'm not the best guy to be out there on the money. Um, it sounds like you're doing that work. So that's part one. Um, uh, part two, we need to be um, looking deeper into the history. We need to be essentially doing revisionist history, like Kevin Cruz did around Eisenhower, um, like we need to, uh, what we need to do, and it started to happen uh, with historians like Kim Phillips Fine and Bethany Morton. These are great scholarly historians who are saying, um, let's look at uh, why the United States is alone among developed nations without a powerful organized labor movement. And let's look at the role the family and other Christian right organizations played in crushing that, right? And that, that, that history is relevant to the moment now. If we want to understand why we don't have universal health care, you need to understand the question of why we don't have a powerful way to move it. The third level um, is st work like what the, the Daily Oklahoman did, um, local work, work like some reporters um, in uh, uh, Pennsylvania around Representative Joe Pitts did. Look at your local representative. What's this person? Ask tough questions. And that can happen both at the, at the city level, at the state level, and at the international level. I was encouraged by uh, the Norwegian Daily Dagbladet. A reporter named Tuka Gerstad noticed uh, that his prime minister, conservative prime minister, Bondovic, was traveling on taxpayer uh, money to go to the family's headquarters, the Cedars, go to prayer breakfast. And he did the obvious thing. Well, what's that about? What's that about? Just ask question. No conspiracy theories are involved. You are using public money to travel to a private off the book religious event. Can you tell us more about that? Um, that needs to be happening uh, around the world. It's happened, happened in Norway. And what I've been encouraged is cut. The nice thing about the global platform of Netflix is um, suddenly this story is international. And in fact, it's gotten more play uh, and, and some places abroad than it has here, where it's become a debate and where I'm not going to name the countries because I want these reporters to be able to go about their work uh, until they're ready. 
ha have started digging in and started looking like, oh, look, here are my leaders meeting with these American politicians through this prayer breakfast movement. And what influence are they having? Is it like what we see happened in, in the series, what happened in Romania or Nigeria or Uganda? Is that same influence being brought to bear uh, in my country? And what's the paper trail and what's the money? So there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and not to say that the family is the most important story, even in the question of understanding the Christian right in America. But it is a key to understanding a great deal of it. And so I'm, I'm, I have to say, I'm, I'm going to catch up and follow your reporting more closely because you're, t you're doing the work that needs to be done right now. Well, we, it's actually, we, we kind of moved on to other things after the prayer breakfast, but now I've got the itch again. <laughs> so thank you very much for that. And thanks for the series. It's uh, called The Family. It's on Netflix right now. It's available. The, Jeff Charlotte uh, is also the author of the book it's based on, The Family, and also based on C Street. So thanks very much for joining me here on TYTI Daily, Jeff. And uh, if uh, you enjoyed our, our interview here, I hope you'll subscribe to us here on YouTube and follow us on uh, Facebook as well. And uh, take care of each other and take care of yourself. Bye, guys. Thank you.